Today's program is sponsored by Temple Emmanuel and the Jewish Genealogical Society of Southwest Florida. I'm a proud member of both. JGS is all about family, and Temple Emmanuel is like my family. Because the JGS of Southwest Florida and Temple Emmanuel, there are several events happening within the next month, but I'm only going to highlight two. On March 28th at 10.30, Temple Emanuel member Arnie Kaplan will present an overview of the Arnold and Deanne Kaplan collection of early American Judaica, which consists of 12,000 items spanning from 1555 through 1890, and he will show several of these items. On April 16th at 1 o'clock via Zoom, the Jewish genealogical Genealogical Society will present Robin Maggot, who will talk about finding your Eastern Jewish family on the JRI Poland website. There are many people from the JGS and the Temple who helped make today's event possible. I thank all of these volunteers, and I thank everyone for coming today. I welcome our special guest, Randy, and his son, Joey, right here in the front and you will be hearing from them later. I know for sure Randy, maybe Joey will say hi too. I, we'll see, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Okay, before I introduce Randy, I would like to read some email messages that I received from people after they heard that Randy was speaking at Temple Emmanuel today. Just five and they're very short, the first one. Wow, that's gonna be a terrific session. I've met Randy several times and he's a great presenter, but unfortunately I'll be in Miami at the time so I'll have to miss it. <laughs> Number two, Randy is my cousin. Malcolm Schwartz here, second cousin to Randy. Okay, here's the next one. Interestingly, according to the DNA studies, my dad is distantly related to Randy's mother, Barbara Zeisel. You'll have to find out who that is. Okay, and the next one. I saw the lady in gold painting at a Landau Museum in New York City when it was first returned. Okay, now here's, the, I saved the best one for last. I hope to attend the Schoenberg a presentation on the 25th, that's gonna be at Burns Court, and, and uh, Women in Gold is one of my favorite movies. I own the DVD and watch it about once a month. <laughs> I know it is a drama, drama, these are hard words. I know it is a dramatization, but well done. It is very inspirational. I wish I had known about the Clint painting when I lived in New Jersey. I definitely would have visited her in the gallery in New York City. Okay. I first met Randy when I saw him on Zoom at the 2000 International Jewish Genealogy Conference. Randy competed in a genealogy death match and won. <laughs> I have been a big fan of Randy ever since. And when I saw his name on my caller ID two weeks ago, oh my gosh. You, my sister Lizzie may know. Was I excited? I'm over the moon. How many times did I call you in the last two weeks? 47. Okay. Well, it was like a dream come true. I, I mean, I'm just like so excited. So now here's my little couple sentences about Randy. Randy is a lawyer and genealogist based in Los Angeles who specializes in legal cases related to the recovery of looted or stolen artworks particularly those by the Nazi regime during the Holocaust. I introduce to you Randy Schoenberg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. I, this was put together in about 10 days, and I don't know how Kim did it, but look at all of you here. I'm so happy that everybody was able to come. My son Joey and I are here because Tomorrow night there'll be a sneak preview of a documentary film, a genealogical documentary film, uh, that we made last year where I dragged Joey, who was maybe not so interested in his roots, uh, on, a, on a roots journey that took us back about 500 years. So that'll be at, where's the Burns Court uh, tomorrow. And if we have time at the end of my presentation, I'll show you the trailer for the film so you get an idea for what it is. I hope all of you are there. Uh, there are probably more people here today than are coming to the film tomorrow. But anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and, uh, and I'm always happy to talk about this amazing case that I handled for my, my grandmother's very close friend, Maria Altman, 
And uh, so let me just jump into it. Let me get the, uh, the pointer here, the, the clicker somehow. So yeah, so this is the story of how I helped Maria Altman recover her family paintings. And uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. There she is. So there's Maria uh, in her home as I knew her in, in Los Angeles. And when, uh, when I was putting this together, I found an old picture of her that was in my grandmother's thing. So the, the, the Altmans, Maria Altman and her husband Fritz, and my mother's parents, Eric and Trudit Seisel, had been friends for a long, long time. Fritz, uh, her husband, and my grandfather, Eric Seisel, were friends already in Vienna in the 20s and 30s. And then when the families escaped, both of them escaped the Nazis uh, in 1938, and they ended up in Los Angeles. And, and the families became very, very close. So my mother was an only child, uh, and Maria and Fritz's four children were constant companions and uh, matter of fact Maria's two older boys each claimed that they were responsible for my mother actually going through with the wedding to my father uh, she was having cold feet so anyway it's a very very close family relationship uh, and so it was a real pleasure for me to be able to represent Maria in this amazing case so here this is really her story so let me give you some of the background um, in Vienna uh, in the uh, turn of the 19th to 20th century, around 1900, there was a very large and very important Jewish community. But you have to understand that that, that community was largely people who had immigrated to Vienna in the previous 50 years. Uh, around 19, 1848, there were only about 5,000 Jews in Vienna. By 1900, there were about 200,000. So what happened? Uh, Vienna was the capital of Austria-Hungary, this enormous empire. It's now 12 or 13 different countries including even parts of Ukraine, were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Jews were finally given full civil rights in the Austro-Hungarian Empire only in 1867, so two years after the end of the US Civil War. Jews were given full civil rights. They were allowed to move where they want and live where they want and work in professions that they wanted. And so from all over the empire, Jews sort of flooded into the capital, which is where all the economic activity was based. And so. Not everybody, uh, but quite a few Jewish families became very, very wealthy at that time because it coincided, their arrival coincided with enormous economic activity at the end of the Industrial Revolution. There were railroads being built and things like that. And so some of these families became very wealthy. And Maria Altman's family is, is one of these. Mine was not. Uh, but, uh, but here are her parents, Gustav and Teresa Blochbauer, and they had younger siblings Ferdinand and Adele Blochbauer. So it was two boys named Bloch married two girls named Bauer. And the Blochs owned a sugar company that was the, they had a monopoly on sugar production. It wasn't with sugar cane in that part of the world. They made it from sugar beets, right? So they grew sugar beets in Bohemia, where they were from, and, and dominated the sugar market. The Bauer girls were, their father was in banking and railroad. So these two very wealthy families joined together, two brothers married two sisters. And uh, when, the, when the brother of Adela and Teresa died, there was no Bauer to carry on the family name, so they combined the names. So they took two sort of ordinary Jewish names, Bloch and Bauer, and became Bloch Bauer. Sounds much more fancy, right? And, uh, and fitting for them. So this is uh, Maria's uncle and aunt, uh, Adela. And they uh, lived in this beautiful palais. Uh, if you ever go to Vienna, there's the famous Ringstrasse, the big boulevard that circles the old town. And this is one block outside, uh, around the corner basically from the opera, just to give you an idea. It's a very, very fancy part of town. And they had this whole building. Uh, Ferdinand was the president of the sugar company. He ran it from, from this uh, home. And then they lived on the upper floors. This, they of course had an uh, enormous art collection, not just the Klimt paintings, but they had dozens of these, what they call Biedermeier style paintings, Austrian 19th century paintings. They had a Rodin sculpture. Um, they had the largest collection of antique Austrian porcelain in the world, 300 settings. So each setting is a cup and saucer. Can you imagine having that in your home? Uh, absolutely gorgeous. They had you, if you're rich, right, you have to have a nice little summer house. So this is their summer cottage uh, in Bohemia, near where the blocks were from. And uh, this, this is a postcard that was sent to Maria from there. It's a, um, uh, one of the side stories to this 
already amazing story is that this house outside of Prague was taken over by the Nazis when they annexed Czechoslovakia in March of 1939 and used for what they called the Reichs Protector of Bohemia and Moravia. So that would be the highest Nazi official in the Czech Republic. And so first it was a man named Konstantin von Neurath, and then he was moved out and replaced by Reinhard Heydrich. So for those of you who, who know history and the history of the Nazis, Heydrich is in basically everybody's top five Nazi list. He is the one that planned the infamous Banzai conference where they, they plotted out the extermination of all of the Jews in Europe. Reinhard Heydrich was living in the Blochbauer castle at that time when he went to Banzai to hold the Banzai conference. He returned back to the castle several weeks later. He was driving into Prague and was assassinated by Czech partisans. Uh, and that led then to a horrible reprisal. It was infamous even at that time for the Nazis where they took everybody in this town uh, nearby called Lidice and basically killed all the men and sent all the women and kids to concentration camps. That was so famous, there were actually two Hollywood movies made during the war in the 1940s about that whole episode and there's been several movies since then. One of those early Hollywood movies was scored by my mother's father. Uh, Eric Zeisland, just to bring it all full circle. Um, okay, so let's get on to Gustav Klimt, right? Gustav Klimt was, uh, around 1900, the best, the most famous, the most expensive artist in, in Vienna. He had started out as an academic painter, getting lots of commissions on all those big government buildings that they were building at the end of the 19th century. But he decided to become a little bit more modern uh, for the tastes of the Habsburgs, and and lost uh, his position as an academic painter, but formed something called the Secession. So he and some friends seceded from the academy and they formed their own arts group. He got tired of his friends in the Secession, just went out on his own and was an independent painter. And he survived based on commissions from very wealthy families, including these sort of nouveau riche Jewish families that had come to Vienna like the Blochbauers. Uh, Another family that really supported him was the Zuckerkandl family and then also the later family. So between the Blochbauers, Zuckerkandls, and Laters, they had almost 30 paintings that they commissioned from Klimt. That was about 30% of his large scale output. So just to give you an idea. Uh, Klimt was also very famous for having lots of nude models around and he painted in a large, long smock there with nothing on underneath, apparently. And when he died uh, after the flu epidemic in 1918, uh, he, he uh, in, the, in the proceedings that followed, I think there were 18 illegitimate children who claimed that he was the father. So gives you an idea of what type of person he was. Um, so Ferdinand uh, commissioned Klimt to do a portrait of his young wife in, uh, around 1903, I think he started. There are hundreds of these sketches of Adele Lochbauer, and finally in 1907, he finished his very famous, justly famous, portrait number one of Adele Lochbauer, and it includes this gold mosaic uh, with gold leaf. He had apparently gone to Ravenna in Italy where they have old Roman mosaics, and he wanted to replicate that style, so he started using gold leaf. I think there are only three or four paintings in this style. The slightly more famous uh, one is The Kiss, uh, which everybody knows. It's on, still probably in every dorm room in America. Joey, you can confirm or deny. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, this one is, uh, according to the experts, the best preserved because they, they tried to restore the kiss and sort of ruined it. So this is the best preserved of the gold paintings. Uh, Ferdinand commissioned a second portrait of his wife, Adela, in 1912. Now, there were rumors when the first one was finished because of Klimt's reputation that maybe he and Adela had had sort of an affair. And, I, and Maria told me about this. She said, oh, everyone was talking about it. And I even asked my mother, was it true that Klimt had an affair with Aunt Adela? And, and she said, my mother said, of course not. And, and Maria said, well, she would have said that even if it had been true. So she sort of believed it. But the experts say that whatever heat was on between Klimt and Adela in 1907 was clearly off in 1912. It's a much more reserved and cool portrait. It has these Japanese figurines in the background. But she's the only person who had two full-length portraits done by Klimt. The Blochbauers had then several other 
clipped landscape paintings, this beech wood or birch trees, uh, depending on which tree you look at, it has a different title. Uh, the apple trees, which may have been painted by Klimt when he was a guest at their summer home outside of Prague. Um, and this is a slightly unfinished, if you look in the right hand corner, uh, slightly unfinished, so the thinking is that it was purchased from Klimt's estate when he died in 1918. Uh, and then they had the third of four beautiful pictures of this castle on Lake Otter in Austria. So they had the two portraits and the four landscapes of Klimt. Klimt had died. And then unfortunately, Adele developed meningitis uh, and, and passed away in 1925. She was just 41 years old. And she had written a handwritten will two years earlier uh, after both her parents had died. And uh, it's, these are, this is half of it here. Um, and she was probably helped by Maria's father, who was the lawyer for the family. And he's named as a sort of executor in, in the will there. And I'm going to talk about, about a portion of this will because it's, it's important to what happened later. So in the, in the top part of the second page, she makes a lot of bequests. According to Maria and everybody, Adela was a very civic-minded person. Um, she was a strong supporter of the new socialist government that came into power in Austria after the Habsburg Empire collapsed at the end of World War I. She was a very civic-minded individual, and so there are a lot of bequests to various public institutions. And in the last paragraph there, she says, my two portraits and four landscapes of Gustav Klimt, bitte ich meine Ehegatten, that means I ask please that my husband give these after his death, to the Austrian gallery in Vienna. In the same paragraph, she also says that her library in Vienna and outside of Prague should go to the Vienna People's and Workers Library. Right? So again, in this last sentence, she says, I ask my husband after his death to give my two portraits and the four landscapes to the Austrian gallery and my library to the People and Work People's and Workers Library. So, uh, so here's what she's talking about. This is the Austrian gallery. The, museum that's formed out of one of the Habsburg palaces in, in Vienna. And uh, it, at that time, was being used for Austrian art. Uh, Ferdinand became the president of the Friends of the Austrian Gallery. There were very big supporters of these civic institutions. And, and at the time she passed away, uh, she certainly uh, intended that her husband would give the paintings to this, to this uh, gallery. Now, the, Ferdinand and Adela did not have any, any children, unfortunately. I think Adela um, had several stillborn babies, very tragic. And, uh, but, but their siblings, the older siblings, had five children. That's why Maria, uh, the baby of the family, was still around later. But the, Ferdinand and Adela, I think as a result of that, they collected a lot of artwork and supported a lot of civic causes and wanted to leave that behind. But of course, things changed after that. Um, just to make things a little confusing, there was a seventh painting that Ferdinand bought. This was of their friend Amalia Zuckerkandl. Amalia, part of that big Zuckerkandl family that had purchased a lot of Klimt paintings. This is also obviously an unfinished portrait by Klimt of Amalia. Amalia herself was uh, deported and murdered by the Nazis in Belzec along with one of her daughters. Um, so this is a portrait of a, of a victim of the Holocaust. So he had seven paintings, and then he gave one away uh, to the Austrian gallery. He gave this Schlosskamera Matze picture uh, in 1936. So before he died, he was president of the Friends of the Museum. They needed a good landscape, and so he donated this and had six again. Just not the same six that are in the Dela's will, just to make things a little confusing for us. Uh, so. Maria then uh, gets married in December 1937. She's born in 1916, so she's just 21 years old. And she referred to her wedding to Fritz, who was almost 10 years older than her, as one of the last great Jewish weddings in, in Vienna. Uh, and it was a combination of a very important family. Maria's family I already told you about. Fritz's older brother, Bernard Altman, was a uh, sweater manufacturer and a real magnate. Uh, in, uh, of that time, after World War I, he just made uh, a oodles of money and bought lots of artwork and, and had lots of property. And Fritz was the younger brother, who, an aspiring opera singer. So Maria and Fritz got married. They went uh, on their honeymoon to the Italian Alps, 
right? And then they came home, and in February, Maria turned 22, in February 1938. And then three weeks later was the infamous Anschluss, the annexation of Austria by the Nazis, where they waltzed in. Uh, many Austrians, unfortunately, were cheering them on. And from one day to the next, Maria and her family's uh, fortunes changed completely. They were on top of the world, and now suddenly they were on the bottom uh, as the Nazis took over Austria. So uh, what happened? Well, as I mentioned, Fritz's older brother, Bernard, was very wealthy. He was a target of the Nazis, and he fled uh, immediately right ahead of the Nazis from, uh, when they came in on the Anschluss. And he was one of these business geniuses, as I mentioned. I, I always say he, he, he's the type of person you could drop him on a deserted island on Friday, and by Monday he'd be a millionaire. He just sort of spun money somehow. So, so Bernard Altman flees the Nazis, and he wires all of his customers who owe, uh, who owe money to his firm and he says, don't send any money to Vienna, I'll come and pick it up. And he goes to Budapest, and he goes to Rome, and Paris, and London, and picks up the receivables that are owed to his firm, and then takes the money and says to the British, I'd like to start a new company in Liverpool. Can I come in? And he says, well, come in. And he started up a brand new business immediately in Liverpool, England. Well, the Nazis were not very happy about this, because, of course, they intended to confis confiscate all Jewish property. And so in retaliation, they went and they arrested Fritz, Maria's new husband, and they sent him to Dachau. This is not in the film, if you saw Woman in Gold, because the filmmakers told me this, it would be a whole other film if we told Fritz's story. Uh, he was actually sent to Dachau, which was not as dangerous as it became, but still a very dangerous place. Many people didn't uh, survive even that summer in Dachau. And he was there several months until his older brother Bernard managed to raise enough money to pay a ransom and get his younger brother out of Dachau. And Maria said she had to go with the Gestapo to Berlin to sign papers, and, uh, uh, but, but everything went fine and Fritz was released from Dachau. But they were still put under house arrest and didn't know whether they could leave. And they ended up, and this is portrayed I think very well in the film, they, they made a, uh, a sort of fake dentist appointment and escaped out the back and were met, uh, were able to go to a plane and they were taken to Cologne in Germany and from there they were supposed to meet someone who didn't show up so they made their way to the border to try to get into Holland. Uh, and at that time, Jews trying to flee Germany were treated like illegal aliens, right? They were not allowed into Holland. Holland was patrolling its borders and sending people back. But they found a priest who helped them uh, pass through the border when there wasn't a guard there. That priest was later uh, caught by the Nazis and executed for, for helping people escape, just to give you an idea of how dangerous this was. But finally, in Holland, then, they were met by Bernard Altman, Fritz's older brother, who flew them to safety in Liverpool. And from there, he sent them on to Fall River, Massachusetts, where he started up yet another factory. Bernard, uh, so they lived there, they had their first child, and then when the war started in 41, uh, they moved on to, to Los Angeles, where Fritz wanted to work in, the, in aerospace and, uh, and did help out in the, in the war effort. Uh, so that's what happened to Maria and Fritz. What about their uncle Ferdinand, right, and all the, the paintings? So let me go through uh, what happened there. So Ferdinand, like uh, Bernard Altman, was very prominent, very wealthy, and he immediately fled ahead of the Nazis so he wouldn't be captured, and he went to his estate outside of Prague, which was still free at that time. This is March of 38. But by one year later, March of 39, the Nazis had taken over all of Czechoslovakia, and so he had to flee again, and he ended up going to Switzerland, to Zurich, Switzerland. And he managed to stay in, uh, in Zurich through the end of the war. He had no money. His friends put him up in a hotel. Uh, some people, when, when we were dealing with this, said, oh, he must have been wealthy. He was staying in a hotel. You know, there wasn't a lot of tourism going on in, in World War II, so the hotels were all empty in Zurich, so it was relatively cheap for his friends, I think, to find him a room there. And he, uh, he lived there sort of without any money, without any family, through the war, survived till the end of the war, and then died in 1945, just as the war had ended, never being uh, able to return to Vienna or to see any of his family again. So very, very sad. The Nazis, of course, had designs on Ferdinand's property. The sugar company was confiscated. Uh, the house was, was uh, taken over and used as, as the headquarters of the railroad 
and things like that. Um, and they had a meeting in January 1939 in his home. So again, the Anschluss is March 38. So January 1939, there's a meeting in his home and it's called by this lawyer who has the unfortunate name of Dr. Eric Fuhrer. Uh, and Dr. Fuhrer is the lawyer who was appointed to liquidate Ferdinand's estate and pay off all sorts of discriminatory taxes and things that were levied against him. And so he holds a meeting where he invites representatives of all the museums, uh, also the representative of the taxing authorities and the Gestapo, and, and even Hitler sends a, a representative because you probably know Hitler had studied art in Vienna as a young man and they didn't let him in to art school, to the academy. And Maria always said if they just let him in, right, the whole world would have been a better place. He could have painted his landscapes and whatever. Uh, but he fancied himself, of course, an art collector, he and Hermann Goering. And so he had right of first refusal on all Jewish collections. So he sent a representative to this meeting, uh, who's listed there. And it lists all of the artworks in their home, right? Everything in their home, all the, the rugs and the porcelain and, and all of these different paintings. And they basically divided it up between all these entities. So Hitler, first refusal, right? He, he takes, not a Klimt, because <laughs> Klimt is too modern for him. Uh, he takes this Count Esterhazy with the white rabbit. Um, and if any of you saw the movie, The Monuments Men with George Clooney, where they, the American soldiers come in and and uh, and find at the end in these salt mines all these all these paintings. So this is one of these that was found in this in the salt mine. Do you have, you have a question? What's the value of that? One? Well, well, I have no idea. But we we can do questions at the end. I don't want to get sidetracked by Hitler's taste. But anyway, this is this is one of those those paintings that was recovered in the in the salt mines there. Um, but let's go back to the, the Klimt paintings and figure out what's going with them. It's a little complicated, so hold on to your seats. So the, the museums in Vienna were interested in these Klimt paintings. And so the Austrian gallery, um, they traded the, the landscape that Ferdinand had already given them back to Dr. Fuhrer. And in exchange, they got the gold portrait and the apple trees. So it was a two-for-one deal. Uh, they then purchased from the estate, and remember the money's just going to the Nazis for taxes, so it's like money's going in a big circle, um, the second portrait. So the Austrian gallery ends up with the two portraits of Adela and the apple tree. The City Museum of Vienna, which is a different museum, buys the beechwood or birch trees. Uh, houses in Untrach is kept by Dr. Fuhrer, along with 11 other paintings from Ferdinand's collection, to pay himself for a job well done. Uh, that's a letter when he says that. Uh, and, uh, and so then what happens to Schlosskammer? Remember, this is the one that was given back to Dr. Fuhrer. He sells that to a guy named Gustav Uschitzky. So Gustav Uschitzky is a Nazi film director who did propaganda films, his most famous uh, at the time was called uh, Returning Home, or Heimkehr in German. Returning Home, and it was about the invasion of Poland, just to give you an idea of, of his artwork. Uh, he uh, used the money from his propaganda films to buy paintings by his father, Gustav Klimt. He's one of those 18 illegitimate kids <laughs> of Gustav Klimt. So, uh, and uh, anyway, so this ends up with Gustav Wyszynski, uh, and uh, the Zucker Congo portrait has a completely different um, scenario. The family uh, of Amalia Zucker Congo claimed that Ferdinand gave it back to her and that they were forced to sell it to a dealer. Uh, I think it's completely false, but as a result of that claim, this painting is still in the Austrian gallery and has never been returned, even though it's listed first here in 1939 in his house. Uh, so from my perspective, it's, it's a 100% looted painting that has still not been returned. Uh, so the painting gets strewn all over the place. The war ends. Maria is in Los Angeles. Her older brothers uh, had escaped to Vancouver, Canada. She had an older sister who was with her husband in Yugoslavia. Uh, and Louisa and her husband and their two kids were sort of trapped there. They thought when they went there that it would be safe, but of course the Nazi uh, affiliates, the Ustasha uh, in Croatia took over and they had to be in hiding. They managed to survive the entire Nazi period as Jews uh, in hiding in U Yugoslavia. They came out when the Nazis were 
defeated, only to be to have uh, Louise's husband, Victor Gutmann, arrested by the communists, by Tito and the communists, and he was accused of being a capitalist criminal and executed. So you imagine being Jewish, surviving through the entire Nazi period, and then being executed uh, by the communists. But that's what happened to Maria's sister's husband. She then fled with her two children to Palestine and was there in 1948 for the War of Independence in Israel. And then afterwards, uh, she joined also Maria's brothers in Vancouver. So the entire family ended up on the West Coast, Maria in Los Angeles, and the, the relatives, her siblings, all up in, in Vancouver, Canada. And it was up to them when Ferdinand died to try to recover his property. He left behind a will leaving his estate, which at that point was nothing other than the hope of recovering things, uh, to his two nieces, Maria and Louisa, and one of the nephews, Robert, uh, who had been his secretary uh, in the sugar company. And the three of them, it was their job to try to find things. Now, Maria, remember, is the baby of the family. I mean, she's really the, she's an accident baby, right? Her, her older sister, who's the number four, is eight years older and then the three older brothers. So she's really the baby of the family. Her older brother, I think, handled all the restitution things, um, along with Louisa, maybe, in Vancouver, and Maria was taking care of her, her four kids, so she really didn't know much about this. But uh, the family hired a family friend in Vienna, a lawyer named Gustav Rienisch. Everybody in the story is named Gustav. I can't do anything about it. So Gustav Rienisch, who's a friendly, uh, nice lawyer, a uh, friend of the families in Vienna, and his job is to try to recover Ferdinand's property. Now, the Nazi period in Austria is March 1938 until May 1945, right? So it's almost uh, seven years. and. It took another three years before Jews were allowed to try to recover their property. So it wasn't until 1948 that restitution laws were enacted that allowed Jewish families to try to recover their property. So Dr. Renish, the lawyer for the family, was preparing for this. And in December 1937, he sent a letter to the Austrian gallery and said, I understand you may have some paintings that belonged to Ferdinand Blochbauer, what is your position with regard to my client's restitution claims? Remember the claims that were just about to come into effect. And the Austrian gallery responded by saying, what restitution claims? We were given these paintings by Adele Blochbauer in her will, and her husband was just allowed to keep them during his lifetime, but now that he's dead, we are entitled to all the clip paintings, and we only have three of the six, you owe us the other three. Okay? And they actually prepared to sue the, the family. Uh, very aggressive position. So Dr. Renish had not even seen uh, the will of the Daily Blochbauer, and he finally had a meeting in April of 1948 with representatives of the museum and the Federal Monument Agency. The Federal Monument Agency in Austria was in charge of what artworks could be exported. Uh, and they have a, a patrimony law in Austria that does not allow artworks to be exported without permission. So it was the practice of the Federal Monument Agency, especially after the war, especially with Jewish families, to deny export permits. So all the Jewish families that were able to recover things, let's say the Austrian branch of the Rothschild family, or the Laders, or the Zucker Kennels, or the Blochbauers, uh, they couldn't export anything out of Austria to their new homes in, if they had survived in America or Canada or England or wherever they went. Uh, because you would apply for an export permit, they'd say no. So Dr. Renish had recovered some property already. He had, uh, the ones that Dr. Fuhrer had taken, for example, or the, the um, ones in, uh, from the Munich Art Collecting Point, and he wanted to send things to his clients, and he knew that they were going to say no. So he had this meeting in April uh, and we know this because he wrote the very next day to Maria's brother and said exactly what happened. He said, and I saw the will for the first time, and it may not actually give the museum a right to the paintings, but then uh, Ferdinand had said he would do it, and so I decided to make a deal. I'll leave the claim, we're going to leave the Klimt paintings in Austria, and I hope they're, uh, to get their cooperation so I can export some of these other older Austrian paintings that he had recovered, the Biedermeyer paintings and some porcelain and some drawings and things like that. Uh, so he made a deal for export permits and that largely worked. They were uh, required by the Austrians to donate uh, 
some more porcelain and some, some drawings, but they were largely able to export all of these other artworks out of the country. Uh, and Austria uh, did this to a number of Jewish families. And so if you'd ask Maria what had happened after the war, she said, oh, we never recovered anything because my aunt Adela had given these paintings to the museum in her will. She had never read the will. She didn't know what it meant, uh, whether it was binding or not. So fast forward about 50 years. Let's see if I have a picture. There we go. There was a journalist in Austria named Hubertus Chernin. And he decided to do research on artworks in the federal museums, where they came from, what their provenance was. And he ended up doing a whole series of articles, a real expose, showing how the Austrian government, after World War II, had extorted donations of artworks to their federal museums in exchange for export permits and other things. Uh, so rather than saying to these surviving families here, you can recover your artworks, they, they held everything still in Austria and enriched themselves. And so as a result of this expose, Austria, to its credit, the government enacted a new law. And the new law, this was in, in uh, let's see, August, September of 1998, it was announced. And it said that if a Jewish family had donated artworks to the Austrian Federal Museums after the war in exchange for export permits, or if there were artworks in federal museums that had never been rightfully returned to Jewish families, they were now going to correct that and give, give the paintings back. Uh, and that's when Maria called me. I was 31 years old. I was working at a law firm in downtown Los Angeles. And she was still very close friends with her family. My grandparents had died, but my mother kept up with her. And she, she knew I was a lawyer. She called me on the phone and said, there's this new law in Austria. Would you help me with it? And she's my grandmother's closest friend. It was interesting, exciting. I had, I had seen the paintings as a kid when I went to, to Austria for the first time. And my mother said, you know, your grandmother's friend, Maria, that's her aunt Adela. So I knew the paintings, but I, of course, didn't know their story. I didn't know how they got into the museum. And so Maria then showed me the documents she had collected. She was the last member of her generation and her family, so she had collected documents from her, her brother and sister. And when I looked at it, it seemed like she had a case that her, these paintings fit under this new law. Uh, it seemed very clear that Dr. Renish had made a deal for export permits for other paintings, and that's exactly what the law was, was about. Uh, there was still a question of the will of Adele Blochbauer, right? She said, I asked my husband, now was that binding or was it not binding? That was going to be a question, but it, in the law, at least as, as I had learned it, uh, there, when it comes to wills, there's a term of art we call precatory language. So precatory language are requests that you make in a will. Uh, the example I like to give is, let's say I had a dog, which we don't, Joey's allergic, but let's say we had a dog and I said in my will, my dear wife, please, after I'm gone, take care of the dog, right? And I drop dead and she says, thank goodness that dog is out of here. I never liked that dog to begin with. That's probably okay. I just said, please take care of the dog, right? But if I said, as a condition of receiving a dollar from my estate, you must agree to take care of our dog in the manner to which he's become accustomed until its dying day, right? That would be sort of a command, a, a requirement. So the problem when you're interpreting wills is the person who wrote the will is dead. You can't ask, what did you mean? Did you mean just a request or did you mean a requirement? Uh, but the law comes up with ways of interpreting wills. And it seemed to me at least, and, and ultimately to other people, that, that this uh, language in, in the Daly's will wasn't binding. Matter of fact, Maria's father, the lawyer in the family in 1926, had written a document in the equivalent of probate in, in Austria saying that the deceased, Adela, made certain requests which do not have the binding character of a testament. Right? So even Maria's father in 1926, when there was no dispute, said this is not binding. Dr. Renish had also written it may not be binding. So I thought Maria really had a case. And so initially there was no case to bring because Austria had set up a commission that was going to decide what artworks to return. And so we waited and I sent documents and communicated with them and I, I said we can come and speak to you and they said no we don't we don't talk to outside parties. And I said you know Maria is a block by she's not an outside party. So no we're going to decide on our own. 
So they ultimately did decide in, in June of 19, uh, when is it, 1999 now, uh, that they were not going to return the Klim paintings. Uh, they returned some porcelain and some drawings that had been donated, but not the Klim paintings. And they said, why? Because these were donated by Adela Blochbauer in her will when she died in 1925. So I said to Maria, I said, you know, I don't think this is right. Your father said it wasn't binding. Dr. Renish said it wasn't binding. It just doesn't, it doesn't read that way to me. Uh, what should we do? And initially we thought, well, maybe we can file a lawsuit in Austria, right? The paintings are in Austria. So we tried that. I found a lawyer and he said, you know, in Austria you have to pay in advance, you have to pay court costs and they're a percentage of the value at stake in the litigation. So at this time we thought the paintings could be worth a hundred million dollars. They would have to pay two million dollars just to start the litigation. So we filed a, a petition to reduce that, which you're allowed to do, and Austria opposed it. And the judge then ruled and said, no, Maria Altman, you don't have to pay more than everything you own, you just have to pay everything you own, right? So all of her assets would have had to have been paid to the court just to start litigation in Austria. So that was not gonna be possible. And so I very naively then said, well, maybe you can sue in the United States. And every litigator has you know, on their, their desk the, the code, uh, the federal code that, that governs all sorts of lawsuits. And there's something in there called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976, which governs when you can sue a foreign state. And you can tell by the title, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, that ordinarily the rule is you cannot sue a foreign state. And these paintings were owned by Austria, Austria the country. But there was an exception when I read it. And the exception said that you can sue a foreign state in a case concerning property taken in violation of international law, where the property is owned or operated by an agency or an instrumentality of the foreign state that is engaged in some commercial activity in the United States. So let's break that down. Property taken in violation of international law. The Nazis, right? That, that should work, right? The, the, if anything was a violation of international law, it's that. Uh, is, are the paintings owned or operated by an agency of the federal state of Austria? Yes, the Austrian gallery, right? Owns or operates the paintings. Um, is that agency engaged in any commercial activities in, in the United States? Well, I found that they published a book with Yale University Press, they advertised, they accept US credit cards. Uh, there was, I thought, enough of a nexus between the Austrian Gallery and the United States that we could sue under this special statute. And, uh, and so I said to Maria, what do, we, what do we have to lose? We'll keep the case alive. And I actually, I left the big firm I was working at and I, I went out on my own and the first thing I did was I wrote a complaint and I filed a complaint for Maria Altman against the Republic of Austria. And it didn't cost $2 million, it was like $140 to file it, it was relatively easy. And, and at the time, there's an email I wrote to Maria, I said, you know, it's just a way of keeping the case alive because it's political dealing with a foreign country, you never know, the government could change, something might happen. So what did Austria do? They, of course, hired a, a nice Jewish law firm to represent them, Proskauer Rose, uh, and uh, they thought that the lawyer was Jewish, it turned out he wasn't. <laughs> that they had hired, but, uh, but anyway, they did what, what any lawyer would do, which is they filed a motion to dismiss this completely crazy lawsuit, right? Uh, and they had about 15 different grounds, and we were in front of a very nice and friendly judge, and much to everybody's surprise, she denied the motion to dismiss and said we could go ahead with the case. So that was great, except that Austria had a right immediately to appeal that decision, because Ordinarily, you can't appeal at that stage, but when sovereign immunity is, a, is in question, then you have a right to appeal. So they appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then I argued for the first time for me in front of the Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit at that time uh, was, was uh, you know, considered more liberal uh, than the Supreme Court, and uh, the Ninth Circuit ruled in our favor. Again, everybody's surprised. Uh, they said we could go ahead with the lawsuit, and I was feeling very good about things. Uh, but then the U.S. government decided to get involved against us. And so our own government 
the United States filed a brief asking the Ninth Circuit to change its opinion. They apparently didn't like the precedent that we had just set about suing other countries, and thankfully the Ninth Circuit did not change its decision, but then when Austria asked the U.S. Supreme Court to hear the case uh, with the U.S. government on its side, that uh, happened, and the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to grant review in the case. So at that point, everybody was certain that we would lose, right? The Ninth Circuit was reversed 150% of the time by the Supreme Court, and uh, it just didn't seem like we were going to win. But I went to uh, Washington, there I am there, in 2004 with Maria, and it was, uh, I, I was very relaxed in a way, of course, I've never had any experience arguing in the United States Supreme Court. If you ever get a chance, by the way, to, to I don't know if they have visitors again now after post-COVID, but it's it's the best theater in, in uh, D.C. It's really, really fun to watch. You don't even have to be a lawyer to enjoy it. It's really amazing. Uh, but I was there, and, and I was just hoping, please can at least Justice Ginsburg rule in our favor, right? I mean, please let, let it not be 9-0, right, against us. And, and I had seen other cases that it was just like a slaughter. I mean, sometimes the lawyers get up there and they just have no chance. Please. And so I, was, I had a little bit of a gallows humor going into it. And uh, fortunately, I was not the first to speak in our case because we had won in the Ninth Circuit. So Austria's lawyer went and then the U.S. government lawyer argued, and they were getting peppered with questions. And I thought, ooh, maybe you know, things are gonna go okay. And I stood up to speak, and you don't give a speech in, uninterrupted like I'm doing now. They, they, they interrupt you all the time. So you basically have an outline of what you wanna say. And so I said, there are four grounds for affirming the Ninth Circuit. Ground one is, and I finished the first sentence. I can't lie about this because it's taped, so you can listen to it on, <laughs> online. So I finished one sentence, and I was interrupted by Justice Souter, who was, clearly the smartest justice on the, on the court at that time. And, uh, and he started asking me this long, convoluted question. And all I heard was da 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 like that. And then the question was over. And I had not the slightest idea what he had just said. Again, I can't lie about it, it's on tape. And you can hear me sort of saying, um, uh, and I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't think I understood the question. And there are gasps from the audience, right? It's like a skater who falls on the first jump. And, 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 but he was so nice and, and sort of you know, rephrased it. And all the other justices smiled as if to say, oh, thank goodness you asked. We didn't understand it either. It was, it was really an incomprehensible question. The only answer I could, you know, that you could really get was, huh, what did you just say, right? So he, he rephrased it. I sort of understood what he was saying. And then the rest of the argument went like a dream because I, by accident, broken the ice, right? And, and, and established my credibility with the court by saying I didn't understand. And the whole rest of it was just a conversation and it was, you know, insane. I mean, I was this kid from Los Angeles represented by grandmother's friend in a case against Austria, the country, trying to recover <laughs> paintings that had been stolen, you know, 80 years earlier uh, and then never left Vienna. So, it, but it, it went terrific. And I just floated out of the courtroom. And my father was a, uh, was a retired judge. And um, he said for the first time, he said, you may even have a chance of winning. I mean, it was, it was that good. And I was so excited. I got home to Los Angeles and opened up the legal newspaper. We have this legal daily journal, it's called. And there was this long article, Court Likely to Reverse Altman Case. It was all about how we were going to lose. And, and, you know, and I, so I called up the journalist. I said, you know, could you at least said, Randy did a great job, but <laughs> Court Likely, because no one knows how wonderful it went, right? He said, oh, trust me, I've been reporting 35 years at the at the Supreme Court, you don't stand a chance. The body language was uh, okay. I said, okay, you're probably right. You know, I I, I wasn't overconfident for sure. And uh, I said, do me a favor. When they announce the decisions, they don't tell the litigants. They don't tell the lawyers that there's going to be a, a ruling. They just announce it. And so the only people there every day are these reporters that are there at the Supreme Court. So I said, here's my home number. It's three hours later in, in D.C., right? When it happens, can you call me? I'll be home. So sure enough, it's in June, and uh, nearing the end of the term, and I get a call from this journalist. Very serious. It's low. This is Dave Pike. I said, okay. 
give me the bad news. He says, not bad news. You won 6-3 decision. Justice Stevens wrote the opinion. I, I think I dropped the phone because I don't remember anything else about the, the conversation. I was so excited and I was just making breakfast, you know, for the kids. And and uh, and so I, I quickly, you know, finished getting dressed and I tried to reach Maria, but her phone was off the hook already. And so I, I ran over to her place and uh, and her kids came over and we celebrated and I was so happy and everybody was hugging and isn't it wonderful? And then after a while we realized, what did we just win? Right? We won the right to start the litigation. It was just the very beginning of the case and it was, this is now 2004. It was started in 1998, so it was six years into it and we were basically at square one. So we returned to earth very quickly and went into the normal litigation mode. And uh, about a year later, we were required to do a mandatory settlement conference. And, uh, and I, I told Maria, I said, don't expect anything. They've, they've refused to speak to us ever. I mean, they wouldn't talk about anything. And, uh, and I said, you can pick the, the settlement uh, judge and you can, we'll do it wherever you want. So we went to their office and they brought in someone from Austria and uh, and he said he started out by saying, you know, I, I sense that both sides would like to get this over with. Now Maria was 89 years old, and I said, you know, yes, of course we would like to have it over with, but I think, you know, they have a different idea of what that might look like. And the the settlement judge said, then, well, uh, why don't we do an arbitration in Austria? Now this is something actually that I had suggested seven years earlier in 1999 when they first decided not to return the painting because I said, listen, this issue of Adela Bochbauer's will, that's something, that's a legal issue that should be decided in a legal way and I proposed that and the Minister of Culture had written back to me, um, no, if you don't like, you don't like uh, what we did, your only recourse is to go to court, which by the way, you should never write to a lawyer <laughs> to do that. Uh, so that's what we did, and then seven years later, then she was adopting what I had said. So I was very excited, and I said, well, I have to talk to Maria, and we went into another room, and I said, isn't this great? We can do an arbitration, and we can get it over with, and she said, are you crazy? Why would I want to go back to Austria and have an arbitration? I, we're doing so well here in, in the courts in the United States, right? We won in the district court, we won the Ninth Circuit, six out of nine Supreme Court justices love us. Why would I ever do that? And I said, Maria, if you want this case decided in your lifetime, we need to, I think we need to take this chance because this was just still the beginning of the case. Even if we had won in the district court, there would have been appeals. Even if we had won all the appeals, the judgment might not have been enforceable in Austria. Austria at that time did not have an enforcement of judgments treaty with the United States. So I said, Maria, this way we can shortcut all of the all of the other issues, the evidentiary issues, all of these legal issues, and just focus on the one that I think we're gonna win, which is this will. And so thankfully she trusted me, uh, and, uh, and so I went back to Vienna. And it's not like in the movie where they have big audience and lots of people. Uh, I went back alone, it was a very, very small arbitration. And we waited then for the result, and it was weeks and then months went by. Uh, and then finally, I was coming home from a late night poker game where I'd lost a little money, feeling <laughs> dejected, and I checked and there's, there's an email. It was midnight in Los Angeles, it was 9 a.m. in Vienna, and it was a decision from the arbitrators. And it was unanimous. All three arbitrators agreed with our position, which was Maria's father's position in 1926. The will was not binding. So these paintings belonged to Ferdinand. He didn't give them to the museum. He, he gave his estate to his nieces and nephews, and they were only left in Vienna because of this exchange for export permits, and therefore, under their new law, the paintings had to be returned. And then we, then we did celebrate uh, quite a bit. Um, so yes. Here it is, the, the, final, the final thing. Let's see if I can get to the... No? We're not able to admit, oh, I see. It wants me to purchase Norton antivirus. <laughs> okay, we've had enough virus issues. Okay, let's see if this works. That's still not working. Let's see. No, maybe I have to press play again. 
There we go. There we go. Okay, so so what do you do then when all of a sudden, unexpectedly, uh, you get five unbelievably valuable clip paintings returned? I, I wanted to get them out of Dodge as fast as we could right before they changed their mind. So I went to the uh, curator that I knew at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and I said, how would you like to have an exhibit of clip paintings? And she said, ooh, that sounds good. What what can we do? And I said, get them out of Vienna for us. And so so we used the LA County Museum. They they uh, they were able to get the paintings out and already in April. The decision was end of January and April um, wow. 4th. We had this amazing exhibit in, in Los Angeles, and I don't have a good picture of it at the time, but it was it was just one room with all five paintings. And Maria was there with her whole extended family, all the children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews. And she had always said that as a kid, she would go over to her uncle's house. Uh, her aunt and David died when she was eight or nine, right? So she would go over to her aunt and uncle's house and after her aunt died, her uncle had all the paintings in one room with flowers in the middle, a sort of a memorial to her aunt, her mother's sister. And, and there she was again, right, in one single room with all these paintings. And for me, that was really the, the, best, the best moment of the whole thing. Um, because Maria was not the only heir, uh, they ended up uh, not wanting to keep the paintings in their home. If you're 90 years old, you don't necessarily want a $100 million painting in your home uh, if you live in a modest home like she did. And so they ended up selling the gold portrait to the Neue Gallery to Ronald Lauder to put on permanent display in the Neue Gallery. It's on 86th and 5th in New York. Joey, you were just there? Yeah, they're, still, they're still there. Uh, still there. A, a, a year later, the Austrian Gallery returned these two statues, which were just described as two statues by Georg Minne uh, on that list from 1939. But they put two and two together and realized that the statues that they had uh, that they had in their collection, which had come into their collection in the 1940s, um, might be the ones from Ferdinand Blochbauer's because here they are at the very first exhibit in Mannheim in 1907, uh, standing right there. So the family donated those to the museum so they could be reunited 100 years later. Um, and that's, uh, that's it, that's the story of the, the Klimt paintings. The, the rest of them were, were auctioned off then at, uh, at Christie's and, and made their way into uh, you know, people who have too much money uh, in their homes, and it, it, it sort of, some people are very sad uh, that, that happened, but these, that's where these were. The Blochbauers were one of these super wealthy families in Vienna, and then the paintings, uh, some of them have returned to, I think Paul Allen bought one, and Oprah Winfrey bought the other portrait, and things like that. So these things will ultimately make their way back into museums, I'm pretty confident, and uh, but for, for the time being, some of them are in, in private collections. And Maria was able to live out uh, the rest of her life. She died uh, at age 95, wow. Wow. Uh, five years later, and, uh, and had a very nice ending to her life. So anyway, thank you very much for I hope I didn't go too long. I, I'm happy to answer questions. And I also wanted to show you the film trailer. Uh, George, should I show the film trailer first, Kim? Okay, so let, let me see how to do that, or maybe uh, my friend's gonna come up and, and help with that. But I'm happy to answer questions. Usually people have some questions about, about it. Do you wanna start with a question while he comes up about the trailer? Yes. Whatever happened to the rest of the paintings and artwork? So there, a lot of, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Renish was able to export a lot of, Maria had one of those old Biedermeyer paintings in her, in her living room. Some were uh, kept by the family, some were sold. Uh, at the time in the 40s when they got them back uh, to to support themselves, but uh, including the necklace. Uh, so the necklace is always always a question whenever I speak. So if you saw the movie, they they made a big deal about the necklace. Whoops! Can you stop it for a second? Yes, thank you. Uh, the uh, so Maria um, Adela has that fancy necklace in the in the gold portrait, and Maria said she got a necklace from her uncle. Uh, for her wedding, it just happened. It wasn't the same necklace as Adela. In the film, they made it into the same necklace, but it was a solid diamond necklace uh, with giant rocks, apparently. And the story about the necklace and it had matching earrings was that Maria had, after her wedding, she had brought them to the jeweler uh, for safekeeping or cleaning or whatever. And when the Gestapo came to pick up Fritz, 
they also asked for all of her jewelry. This is, you know, in March of, of uh, 1938. And she gave over all the jewelry she had in the apartment. And she was so nervous. Remember, she's 22 years old, right? Uh, and she said, oh, and I have jewelry at the, at the jewelers also. So the Gestapo went to the jeweler, and the jeweler gave the necklace to, to uh, this guy, Felix Landau. Um, who they heard afterwards he gave it on to Hermann Goering for Hermann Goering's wife, that's one, one theory. Uh, but for whatever reason, the jeweler didn't give the matching earrings, and so Maria was able to smuggle those out with her when she came in. I, I saw those, and I mean, the earrings were like this big, uh, diamonds, and, uh, and she said that the necklace was, was just as, as enormous. So, um, so that's what happened. So the, the diamonds, of course, these days diamonds are traceable. They have like a little DNA type signature that they can do on diamonds. But of course, in the 30s and 40s, it wasn't possible. And so they never recovered uh, the necklace. Or, and no one knows whether Adela's necklace existed or was an invention by Clint. Um, can I show you the, the film trailer first before, we get, before people have to leave? I'm going to start at the beginning, yeah. Um, if I press play, I hope this works. Uh, so this is a film that I made with Joey, and it's being shown tomorrow at 7 p.m. at Burns Court. For uh, first, it's a sneak preview. It's not not a premiere. We're we're forced to say it's not a premiere because they're still tinkering with it. And and uh, but anyway, here's the trailer. I would hardly believe that you were really the descendant of my hero. As I'm just blown away. I'm about to leave for Vienna, and then Joey's going to come meet me. We're going on a little bit of a roots trip, looking at cemeteries and archives and documents, and we'll see how far back we get. So I get to show you all these neat things. You're that, weird. I'm weird. <laughs> there are just two types of people. The people who know they're crazy, and the people who have no idea that they're crazy. I just know I'm crazy. You will see things you would never expect to see. I always have been interested in memory. That was my dream as a little kid. It's in the soil, it's in the air. It is poetry. It is mystery. You must do it the rest of your life. Closed. Now what? We're going on a treasure hunt. 30 years ago, my neighbors told me, you have an American cousin here. Were separated after World War II and they really had no contact at all. The major point I think what Randy always does all his life is bringing people together. We're tracing our family history back 500 years. It's nice to know where I came from. Not a lot of people can say that. We're essentially missing so many generations because of these atrocities that happened in Europe. So many people came without family, without many memories. I'm the only person in 200 years who wants to look at this, right? He died 400 years ago, and here we are in front of one of his books. To believe that something this old was owned and created by someone that I share blood with. I had this dream that I would start painting some pictures of the characters you're like telling me about. It becomes real, you know. I think for me at least, tracing my family history gives me an entree into the history of the world. It was like magic. From Venice, they go to Prague, to Vienna, to Los Angeles. I think I was maybe more surprised at how enjoyable it was for me retracing some of the steps with my son. It looks a little expensive. We'll take it. Okay. It's that time of life when you start thinking about, okay, who am I going to be and what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? I will always remember it. You could wear that to a Met Gala. Yeah, look, <laughs> I don't think I want to wear it. Uh, I don't want to end up like Shlomo Mojo. He was burned at the stake, after all. <laughs> Have you ever seen what? such a useful mini okay. chainsaw? If you haven't, <laughs> no, no chainsaws. Okay. Uh, sorry. Oh, anyway, that's the film that's showing tomorrow night uh, as a sneak preview at, at Burns Court, right? Uh, so hopefully we'll have a quarter of as many people as uh, are here today at, at that because there's, this is such a tremendous turnout. Uh, more questions? I'm, I, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for all your efforts that we just that you just told us about. Um, 
during your presentation to my untrained ear, it sounded as though you might be fluent in German. So are you? And if so, did that was that a huge benefit during this? Oh yeah. So so I learned German uh, a little from my grandmother, and then I went to to college uh, to Princeton. They're playing in the NCAA's today. Um, and had two years of German and really couldn't speak it very well at all. And then I decided I would do a junior semester abroad. So I went to Berlin for six months, and it all just opened up because I hadn't heard a lot growing up. And uh, and so as a result of that, I'm relatively good. I always say after one or two beers, I'm much better. <laughs> Five beer. But it, yeah, it's five beer. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it definitely helped. So when Maria came, you know, I could read all these documents, uh, not perfectly, but my mother is a German professor also, so she could help. And uh, and Maria, of course, was was fluent in German too. So between the three of us, we really we we could figure things out. Um, and it definitely helped. I don't think I could have done it. Matter of fact, people. Uh, come to me with cases from other places, right? Poland and Romania and wherever, and I, I just, I don't think that I have the ability to do anything. That it's because I knew German, I knew enough about Austria that I could actually do something like this, or at least felt I could do something like this. Um, yes? Uh, yeah, I've got two part or just first okay. off, can you highlight some more of the differences from the film and reality? Sure. And the second part is, can you talk any more about other um, artwork that you have Okay, so the differences and other artwork. So I'll use Joey as a prop. So in the film, we have my wife and I, right, Katie Holmes and Ryan Reynolds, have two kids, but we really have three kids, right? And so when they were doing the film and they showed me the script, I thought, okay, who's going to pay the therapy for the kid that's, <laughs> that's left out? Okay. So, so there's a, there's a scene um, where where our uh, a boy is born, and that's actually Joey. So when I was in uh, I give you an idea of what's sort of what's real and what's not. There's a scene in the film, not to ruin it for you, where I'm packing to go to the Supreme Court and picking out ties, and my wife, Katie Holmes, has her water break. Okay, and and she says, "Oh, don't worry, you keep going. You know, you go to Washington. I'll just take care of it on my own." Okay, so that didn't happen, obviously. Uh, but what did happen, and the reason that's a scene in the film, is that I went off to Washington, and Pam was 30 weeks pregnant with with this guy here. Um, and a day and a half, so it was Monday afternoon, and the argument was Wednesday morning. I was with Maria at the L'Enfant Plaza, and I got a call, and it was Pam, and she said, don't freak out, but I'm in the hospital with preterm labor. She had gone into labor at 30 weeks too early, right? And uh, she said, but they've got it under control, and don't worry about it. So, of course, I told the screenwriter that, and they turned it into this sort of Hollywood-type thing. So it's, it's crazy, but it's not... It, it's related to what actually happened. Um, and as for terms of the of the kid being born, even though it was Joey being born, they called the baby Nathan in the film, oh. his older brother, who was otherwise going to be left out, so they combined the two boys. <laughs> um, there's one other part uh, that that is different than reality, and that is, um, again, not to ruin the film, but one of the emotional... Uh, scenes that they have in the film is Maria saying goodbye to her parents in, in Vienna, uh, which didn't happen like that. So her father actually died over the summer while Fritz was in Dachau. Uh, and the mother, I think, uh, might have escaped even before Maria did. So there wasn't this sort of farewell scene. And But I, I, I thought, okay, artistic license, and, and I didn't really think too much of it. And then I did a screening and someone came up to me and said, oh, that scene, it was so devastating to see Maria say goodbye to her parents. My, my father did the same thing, and, and, uh, and I just can't imagine it. And it was only then that I realized my mom's father did the exact same thing. My mom's parents left on the day after Kristallnacht and left his parents and never saw them again, right? And so the filmmakers, in inventing uh, that story, they really sort of expanded it and made Maria's family representative of all of these Austrian Jewish families or European Jewish families that had to go through that that type of experience. So, so yeah, not everything in the film is is exactly as it happened, but but everything. What I like about watching the film is I can sort of see two films. I can see what they what they made, and then I can think about the real things that it was based on uh, throughout it. So in terms of other cases that I handled, uh, there was one 
because of Maria's case, uh, I did get referred some other some other cases. Um, well, Bernard Altman, for example, got a Klimt painting back. His family, her brother-in-law's family. Uh, there was a Picasso painting that was actually the first case that I had some success with. But uh, there's just there there are on the one hand a lot of stolen artworks that were never returned, and on the other hand, not a lot of cases that you really still can do something about it. Um, so so many years later. So uh, so I did handle a number of different cases, but. Uh, uh, also on Bernard Altman, they had a kind of Leto painting that was returned, but there are three others that are still missing, for example, just to give you an idea. Yes, you've been waiting patiently. I'm a Holocaust survivor and an attorney, so you're so <laughs> one particular interesting to me. But would you repeat how there was jurisdiction to bring the case in the United States? See, the lawyers are <laughs> asking the good questions. The good questions. So jurisdiction... Um, there are different types of jurisdiction. There's subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. So the, these are governed uh, in a case against the foreign state by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And ordinarily, um, for example, you wouldn't have personal jurisdiction. You wouldn't have minimum contacts with a, a foreign state. But you don't, you're not required to have that because foreign states are not considered persons, so they don't get the same due process that persons do. So anyway, it's complicated. But the, but the jurisdiction comes solely from that Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And this one exception to sovereign immunity, which they call the expropriation clause, since I'm here in, in Southwest Florida, I think the origin of that clause was people thinking about Cuba, by the way, because it was, it was passed in 76, but it was drafted already in the late 60s. And I think someone was, was thinking possibly that this would be used uh, against Cuba at some, some stage to get property back, but, uh, but that hasn't happened, obviously. So I hope that answers the question. It's, it's obviously complicated, and the, and the legal issue at the Supreme Court was whether it was impermissibly retroactive to apply the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976 to a case concerning facts that took place in the 30s and 40s. And, yeah, that, that was my question. And, and yeah, so, so um, the approach I took was one that um, uh, that saw the the jurisdictional question as uh, procedural and not substantive. If you're a lawyer, and that was an approach that Justice Scalia had taken in another case, and I thought, you know, if if I if I pitched this case as a tugging at your heartstrings, do something good for the Holocaust survivor, I would never win at the Supreme <laughs> Court. But if I could get someone like Justice Scalia, who was not like that, but thought very analytically uh, to be on my side that I could get the people in the mushy middle, and that's what happened. So Scalia was on our side. Matter of fact, he wrote a concurring opinion berating uh, Thomas and Kennedy for not following him since they had followed him in, the, in that previous opinion. And Justice Rehnquist was an anti-Semite and never ruled in favor of Jews on any case and did not uh, rule in our favor on this one either. But anyway, that's, that's a different issue. So, well, yeah, so the three justices ruled against. They didn't actually rule in favor of Austria. They wanted to remand to the Ninth Circuit to judge it under an impossible standard. So anyway, there was, but it was Rehnquist. Uh, Kennedy wrote the opinion and, and Thomas, yeah, for better or worse. Okay, in the, in the back, they've been waiting. Yes. Hi, in the red or pink. Um, yeah, so the, now I'm thinking about that question, not the first question. The first question was the, Property. the properties. So the, nothing was returned ever from the Czech Republic. Uh, Czechoslovakia didn't, you know, remember these restitution laws didn't come into play until 48, and by 48, uh, Czechoslovakia had become communist, so they never got anything out of Czechoslovakia. That house is lying sort of fallow. It was um, owned by the state and under the seemingly good Václav Havel, they privatized a lot of property uh, that would have been returned once they enacted 
uh, restitution laws after the fall of communism. So like in advance of being forced to return things, they privatized it so they didn't have to. So that castle was never returned. The Austrian uh, Palais was recovered uh, only with, with my efforts with Maria Altman under the similar restitution program because that had been held on to by the Austrians and used as, as the home of the Austrian Railroad for many years. Um, they had, uh, it's a long story, but the sugar company had a lot of different shareholders and was in the Russian zone and they delayed restitution on that, the Austrians, until 1955 when Austria um, was given full sovereignty back and by delaying they were able to force the Blochbauer heirs to give up the house so that all the shareholders could finally get some money out of that. And so they were they were forced to basically give it up for nothing. And as a result, 50 years later, they got it back. So that's the answer. So the question is then, um, other archives and other materials, you know, there are, uh, there's also the Chabad archive in Moscow, for example, uh, that uh, that they've held on to. There, there um, they're different questions when it comes to cultural property that belong to communities as opposed to individuals. Uh, it gets very, very complicated. Sometimes you'll have a, uh, a, a successor community in the, in the place that says, we're the successors to this, and the refugees say, no, that we're the successors. So you have arguments there. Um, it's each case I find is, um, is hard to translate to another. Uh, so a lot of people would would like to use the precedent of the Blochbauer case, uh, but are unable for whatever reason, and uh, and so it's been very difficult. I think there there's there are one or two cases that were able to follow this one, a uh, case involving Malevich paintings, I think, from the city of Amsterdam, but uh, but other than that, it's been very very difficult, and I, I I just don't know enough about the particulars of of the ones you're talking about. Um, in, uh, to, to be able to speak intelligently about them. So I'm sorry. Yes, next to you, there. I'm wondering about your decision to leave the law firm when you took on the case. <laughs> Did you have any other circumstance? It was a combination. I, my wife was very supportive. I had worked at, uh, at one firm for about six years and then went to, to a second firm. Uh, and at the time I had made that first move, I thought, well, I'm gonna try it for three years and see what happens. So it was the end of three years, and uh, the firm itself closed down the office uh, on the day that, that the New York Times reported that I got Maria and her family an award from the Swiss banks. So I thought, okay, that's a good sign that I'm in the right spot. Um, it was, uh, uh, it was a combination. I really wanted to do Maria's case, and they did not. Uh, obviously, most big firms are not in the business of tilting at windmills and filing speculative cases against foreign countries. So, uh, so they were just not interested in doing. They were friendly. The, my boss, uh, his wife's family was also Austrian, and so he was sympathetic, but just didn't didn't think that that was for them. Uh, so I really wanted to proceed with the case and I wanted to do other things, uh, but it was risky. The first first year I made basically no money, I think $20,000 uh, on my own, but uh, fortunately we had saved it enough and then I, I found a partner. Uh, he just passed away actually last year, but he, uh, he was able to give me regular work, real work, while I worked on this crazy case on the side and uh, it turned out that on the side was, was more, more interesting or better in the long run than, than the regular work, but that that's how I survived uh, at that time. But it was it was risky, but I, I'm glad I did it. Obviously, in the back. Hi there. Um, I, I see you're an admin on the genealogy uh, portal on Facebook. Uh oh. If we start talking about genealogy, we'll be here all day. So, <laughs> what, it's fine. What have you enjoyed the most about being, or what have you been surprised about, or uh, enjoyed yeah. the most? So what, what you're speaking about is uh, there's on Facebook there's a group called the Jewish Genealogy Portal, which is actually a group that I um, that I founded and has I think 65,000 members or something like that now, um, and I I uh, I like it very much. I it's a very if you're into genealogy, which I guess some of you are, thanks to Kim inviting everybody. Uh, it's a very good place for getting help. There's hundreds or thousands of people who volunteer their time answering all sorts of questions, whether it's translating something that you can't read or finding documents that you can't find. 
Um, and uh, it's the largest Jewish genealogy group on Facebook now. I found it actually because uh, I got kicked out of the other one uh, for, for saying things that they didn't like. We were working on, on uh, Sid Caesar's genealogy. So I, I like working collaboratively with people and, and so we, people have been working together and, and, uh, and I had found one piece of the puzzle to figure out where he was from, but it, was, it wasn't me working alone. It was a bunch of people at the end. They said, oh, well, no one should publish anything on this because we want to put it in our newsletter. And I said, what do you mean? I've been doing it the whole time on, on, on uh, genie.com, uh, which is where I work. And, and I said, no, I'm not gonna, not gonna take anything down just because you want to put it in a newsletter. And they got very upset with me and, uh, and said, oh, you have to you know, attribute things. And, I, and then, of course, they published in the newsletter and didn't mention that I was the one that found the document on the, on the birth. Anyway, so I founded my own group, and it's now better and bigger and, and more friendly and more open than the others. So and I hope you enjoy it, too, if you're, if you're on there. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, in the back there. Ooh, that's a good question. I, I, the answer is I sort of don't know. So the plan with the, the director, I guess the, he flew in on, on a different red eye and came a little later than I did, so he couldn't be here. But um, their plan is to now submit it to a bunch of festivals, uh, and, and hopefully it will get premiered at, at some festival at some point, and then, and then they go into distribution. Uh, and then ultimately it will be also available for Jewish festivals and things like that. So I imagine... Uh, the hope is that it's going to be shown in theaters somewhere at some point, uh, and then maybe other festivals, and then I hope it gets onto one of the streaming services. That would be my, my hope for it. But right now they're just sort of at the at what they tell me is the beginning of the festival journey. So I, it's so funny. I've told people, I said, I don't know anything about movies in Hollywood, and people say, what do you mean this is your second film that you're involved in? I said, I really, I really am not involved in, in Hollywood enough to know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Hopefully you'll be able to see it soon. All the way in the back first. Yeah. The, the art school that was run by, uh, the art school that rejected Hitler, mm -hmm. was it run by Jews? I have no idea, and I don't think so. <laughs> Hi, Randy. It's so nice to finally meet you in person and not on Facebook. <laughs> and yeah. I sat next to Randy's mother at a concert in Vienna several years ago. It was really a treat. But anyway. My mother was an executive, I think I told you this, an executive secretary with Bernhard Altman and Company. She actually worked for, I think, Wolf Fletcher, who was the brother-in-law. Right. And sadly, the company went belly up after she retired. But I have in my possession two very large scroll photographs of banquets that they held at the Waldorf Astoria. Wow. Wow, and I amazing. was wondering if there are any family members that might be interested, or if I'm best off just pursuing with the Leo Beck Institute. I haven't I haven't heard from them in a while. I could uh, email me, and I can try to try to find out if I can find any of them. Um, it, it was Bernard Altman. Since we're talking about Bernard Altman, Maria's brother-in-law, the millionaire, right? Who had spun money. He also um, he had two wives, but they overlapped, and uh, and so. Uh, so he had his first wife uh, and uh, a couple children, and then uh, he fled and didn't tell the first wife. And the, the Gestapo came to the door, and she said, oh, my husband isn't here. And they said, oh, yeah, we know. He fled with his mistress and two kids uh, to Paris, and they had a third kid in Paris. Uh, and he married her, the, the, the second wife, and, and until they... And so only two wives, but they overlap a little bit. So the two sides of the family aren't so friendly with each other. And uh, so when I was representing that side of that family, it was a little bit, a uh, little bit tricky every once in a while. But there are some descendants. So if you write me, I'll, I'll see if I can, I can track them down. Uh, Malcolm, my cousin. Just in regard to the uh, seating tomorrow night, <laughs> if if you don't have tickets, understand that there's a waiting list already, but you can oh. sign up. That's, that was news to me, but that's good news. Is it really a waiting list already? Yes. Okay. If you do have tickets, the theater is saying, please get there a half hour early, because at a half hour before the theater, if you don't show up, we'll start using the waiting list. Ooh. 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 
Well, well there's no parking. I'm, I'm not from Sarasota, so not, don't blame me <laughs> for, for any of the draconian rules of the festival, but, uh, but I'm happy to hear you. It is a small thing, and unfortunately, we're only doing one showing. Uh, and it's not online, so this is this is it for now. But uh, it's good to know that people want to see this film, and th it's probably thanks to Kim for getting the word out. Uh, otherwise, I don't think anybody would be coming at all. <laughs> Ray, I'm just curious, of all the ancestral lines of yours that you've researched, what is the furthest back date you've gotten to? Well, in, in, so in the film, we go back 500 years to the beginning of the ghetto in Venice. Uh, there are some lines of my family that go back to Frankfurt. Uh, in the 1400s uh, or so, but you know, it's this. This is a line where I really documented every step of the way. The other ones, I haven't done that type of work. But if you're lucky enough to have family from the large cities like Vienna or Frankfurt or Amsterdam, places like that, you're more likely to be able to trace back far because of the the cemeteries and and various records that exist. For most Jewish families, like my mom's family, I can go back into the 1700s. They're in Moravia, they're in the same austro hungaria area, but not in the big cities. And if you're not in the big cities, it's, it's much more difficult uh, to get back. But we're all related to these people. You know, if you go back 500 years, you have thousands of ancestors. And so uh, chances are that, that one of them is one of these rabbis or you know, famous Jews that lived at that time. Uh, you just have to figure out how, <laughs> and, and and it's very difficult for mo for most families. I just ha I just happen to be very 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 lucky in my genealogy, so uh, and, and and in my law cases. So I've been very very charmed and lucky my whole life, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, give us one more thing to say. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. First of all, I have a gift for you. And Joey, come up here. Actually, the best gift I have for you is Rabbi Sheffrin. So I, I'm going to have him say something, too. So this is a gift for you. Thank you. All right, and here's a gift for you. Thank you. And I want you to know we have a wonderful rabbi here from Los Angeles. Yay. And we also have a gift shop that's open. Yeah. I was going to say I have a gift shop announcement, so please go to the gift shop. And thank you both very much. I, I would like to pass the mic over to Rabbi Sheffrin. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Joey. Friends, uh, if you are not Temple members, I want to welcome you to Temple Emmanuel and let you know that if you have tickets for tomorrow night's movie and you want to sell them for a high profit, that you can donate the, 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 uh, what you gain to the Jewish Genealogical Society or the Temple Emmanuel Membership Committee. And we have no programming here at the Temple tomorrow night, so feel no guilt if you do go to the movie. In fact, we encourage it. Um, Randy, Joey, thank you so much for your hopeful, personal, inspiring, long journey and coming here to share it with us. You have helped us uh, feel inspired in our hearts and in our minds as we head into the Sabbath tonight. Uh, we're just grateful for your presence. Thank you so much for sharing with us, for being here. Thank you all for coming. And a special thank you to Kim and our staff and everybody on the membership committee and the Jewish Genealogical Society who worked so hard, so quickly, to make this such a successful event. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Only blessings.